I first heard about today's story when I saw a documentary about it on Netflix. It was one of those rare times where I turn on the TV and I know absolutely nothing about the content I'm about to consume. A woman living alone goes missing in her apartment and nobody notices until three years after the fact. That's creepy in and of itself, but for me the plot twist is that Joyce Vincent wasn't who you'd think of when you consider somebody going unnoticeably missing. She was beautiful, talented, charismatic, she had lots of friends, family members who were close to her, and I don't say this lightly, she really was stop in the street and stare at her, good looking. Absolutely not what you would consider as somebody who would blend in and go unnoticed, but a series of simple life decisions led everyone to just assume she was somewhere else with someone else. So, here we go. Death is never a happy occasion. Every human life is precious and no matter how good or bad the person in question may have been on earth, for the people left behind it can alter their own lives forever. It is never a joyous occasion to see someone leave this plane of existence. That's why funerals take place to offer a proper send off for these individuals. However, what if you died and no one noticed for over two years? Well, this was the reality for a woman named Joyce Vincent. A regular girl who would detach herself from a consistent place in society to the point that no one noticed her death. Vincent's upbringing was a tough but somewhat conventional one. Her parents were immigrants that moved to London, England and in 1965 gave birth to Joyce, one of five children. They would grow up in the Fulham area of London and due to Joyce's mother's passing away when she was just 11, she was raised by her sisters for the most part. They were close. She attended an all-girls school and left with no qualifications, but she wasn't worried because Joyce had a dream and the talent to back it up. Joyce desperately wanted to break into the music industry and she was prepared to work hard to get where she wanted. She had a wide range of industry contacts and was even videoed backstage at the Nelson Mandela International Tribute for a Free South Africa concert. But Joyce was no dummy. She knew she had to pay the bills and elected not to go on the dole like a lot of other artists do between jobs. She took a job as a secretary at OCL, a shipping container company, before moving up to a law firm and then working within the Treasury Department at Ernst & Young. It was a prestigious position in itself, but also rather conventional and unremarkable as far as careers go. She was described as a hard worker who took pride in her work and herself, her appearance being important to her. However, things started to gradually move downhill for Joyce. She inexplicably resigned from her post at Ernst & Young in 2001 without giving a reason. Colleagues recalled rumours of her leaving to travel with a group of 20 people. Others said she had been headhunted for another job. Some around her said, as with her personal life, Joyce was flippant. She was seen as someone who would walk out of jobs if she clashed with a colleague rather than have a confrontation. She began going to the recording studio less and spending her days at a shelter for women who had suffered domestic abuse. During this period, she worked as a cleaner in a cheap hotel. She gradually cut all ties with her family as well. There was no reported fight or fallout or disagreement. She simply cut contact with her family for no clear reason. They claimed she had started to distance herself from them slowly, starting with small things like not returning a phone call. Many speculate that she was trying to hide from a mysterious abusive boyfriend whom she had last been in a relationship with and she feared that contact with her family would allow him to find her. Her sisters claimed to have at one point hired a private investigator who was able to find her apartment but wasn't able to get into contact with her. She was eventually moved to a bedsit where she would spend her last days. This was a service provided by the Metropolitan Housing Trust which aimed to help those who had a history of domestic violence. What's strange is that there's really no record other than this of any specific relationship ever taking place. She didn't talk about a guy to her friends, she wasn't seen with one around the time, and never offered any explanation about her situation to anyone. Like I said, she had a lot of pals. She wasn't a loner, in fact Joyce was a total social butterfly, flitting from one group to another. What's perhaps situational is she didn't have a core group of friends. 
Instead, she relied on the company of relative strangers who came with the package of a new boyfriend, a colleague or a flatmate and would cease contact with them as quickly as she had started the friendship. She would pop into the recording studio to see those friends, nip down to the local where there was always somebody she knew to chat with or catch up with and see familiar pals at gigs, but all with very sporadic, unscheduled get-togethers. She wasn't on drugs that anyone could tell and nobody noticed any erratic behaviour. In November 2003, Vincent went to the hospital after she vomited up blood, which is obviously never a good thing to do. Her doctor determined that she had a peptic ulcer and she stayed in the hospital for two days with no visitors, returning to her flat after two days of treatment. She was also a long time asthma sufferer. It's thought that this is one of her last outings before her death. Now, this is where the story turns from unfortunate to eerie. Joyce seemingly suddenly died within her flat from an unknown cause, so sudden that she was found on the floor still clutching a shopping bag. It's speculated that this may have been an asthma attack or complications regarding her peptic ulcer. She was surrounded by dozens of undelivered Christmas presents that she had lovingly chosen and wrapped for her many friends and family members who she had presumably planned on seeing over the holiday. The tape and roll were still in the room where she sat, so how did no one notice she was missing? The decompositions and foul smell from her apartment were attributed to the nearby waste bins. Because of her enrolment in the abuse program, her rent was being partially paid by the Metropolitan Housing Trust, so administration believed that she was still alive and well. Although she accrued £2,400 in debt from missed rent payments by the time they found her in 2006, it wasn't a high demand building and was one where missed payments were the norm among its tenants, so the fact that hers was being partially paid made following up the debt low priority. And here's a hella spooky detail. The television and heating had remained on and running for over three years. The TV literally kept playing all that time right in front of her. No one questioned it as the building was in a very loud area of London where the noise would never be heard from outside the flat. Her friends and colleagues didn't miss her as it wasn't unusual for Joyce to flip from group to group and she hadn't any appointments set in stone. And if the sisters had hired that PI as they claimed to have done, he simply walked away after knocking on her door and receiving no response. 38 year old Joyce lay facing the blaring TV surrounded by the half wrapped Christmas gifts with junk mail and bills piling up by her door for over two years. When she was eventually found, the officials who came to her apartment on January 5th, 2006 were there to repossess it due to the unpaid rent. Joyce's body had of course begun to decompose and she was mostly in an unusual skeletal state. At that stage, there was no way that a post-mortem could be carried out and she was only able to be identified through her dental records. By this stage, the family had assumed that Joyce no longer wished to be a part of their lives. Little did they know that she lay dead behind that door. Of course, police searched for the man she had been dating at the time, though they were unable to find him. They didn't know if he had gone away sometime before the investigation began or after, but the strange thing is that there wasn't a single shred of evidence that pointed toward foul play when the investigators finally examined the body. Though officials couldn't necessarily prove what was the cause, they believe Vincent died because of a complication related to either her asthma or her ulcer. They estimate that it was about one month after her hospital stay that she passed. As I said in the beginning of the video, since this sombre event when Joyce was found, a feature documentary called Dreams of a Life was made about it, which is definitely worth checking out. It references the star-studded list of celebrities and influential people she happened upon throughout her life, such as Isaac Hayes and Stevie Wonder to name a few. The film was pieced together through interviews with those that knew Joyce and the end product is a profound and powerful tale of how not forming significant human attachment can result in a lonely death. It should also serve as a reminder to check in on those we love or even that lonely neighbour once in a while because nobody really ever knows what's going on behind closed doors. I'd be interested to know your theory surrounding this case. Until we speak again, sending you good vibes. Stay safe out there.